of you who know me know that I count myself among an incredibly long and deep, deeply important legacy of African-American women. From the black women from whom I am descended, to the black women who taught me how to do this work, from the black women activists who have done so much for this country, to the black women who I count among my family, friends, and colleagues, many of whom are in this room today. I have been the, been the beneficiary of so much love and support, and I hope that this presentation conveys even a small amount of my gratitude for the community of black women of which I am part. This presentation is dedicated to Ms. Alda White, my friend and mentor. I think we should give her a hand. <laughs> Um, I wanted to do a whole section on her. Uh, she, as many of you know, she is the first African-American female attorney for the county of Stafford and a, you know, a, a, a big leader in this community. Um, but I didn't do a whole slide on her because she asked me not to. But um, <laughs> this is my chance to speak to her anyway. This is for you, Ms. Alda. Finally, I need to acknowledge that this presentation is only a sliver of this history. There are so many more individuals and stories to uncover and I look forward to making them visible in the future. Please be patient with me if you feel like there are people missing. Collecting stories is an ongoing process, as you all know, and please be assured that we're working on it. So let's get started, shall we? According to Ms. Ruth Fitzgerald, who many of you know is one of the most important chroniclers of African-American history in Fredericksburg, African and African-descended people arrived in the area that would come to be known as Fredericksburg with early white settlers in the 1600s. Though their early numbers were low, with the growth of tobacco as a cash crop in the late 17th century, more and more African people were brought up Virginia's waterways on slave ships in the 18th century. We do not know the exact number of women who were brought to this area early on, but we have some evidence of women enslaved on one ship that journeyed up the Rappahannock River in the 1770s, the Brig Othello. In 1771 and again in 1773, a small ship named Othello brought at least 85 recently captured and enslaved African people to the docks at Fredericksburg. The ship was based out of Rhode Island and captained by a man named John Duncan, whose correspondence with his investors provides the most information about the ship's journey and its captives. We have not been able to recover the names of any of the people he brought on the Othello, but we do know that there were 31 women, 25 men, 18 boys and 11 girls, and that three died during the journey across the Atlantic, with two more dying after the ship's arrival at Fredericksburg. The image you see here, I know it's kind of blurry, is a fragment of a letter from Duncan. I also know that it's in 18th century handwriting, which is hard to read. Um, but a, a quote from this little passage is, arrived here and brought our slaves all well in, and I imagine to a good market showing Duncan's concern only for the monetary value of the people he and his associates had reduced to commodities. We don't know the names of the women and the girls who were forcibly brought here, and we don't know the specifics of their experiences. Part of doing African-American history means confronting significant gaps over and over and over again, and being creative about our research. We know so little about those 31 women and 11 girls along with the many other women and girls who were forcibly brought here. But we know that the journey across the Atlantic was deeply traumatic, that women and girls were often sexually assaulted, that many died, and that those who arrived here would have been terrified and deeply confused. I hope that we will someday be able to uncover more about these women and girls to fill in the gaps of our knowledge of them and their experiences. By 1810, there were 2,509 people living in Fredericksburg, which had been incorporated as a town with its own court, council, and mayor in 1781. Of those people, 1,260 were white, 900 were enslaved, and 349 were free black people. African and African-American women performed labor integral to the development and establishment of the city of Fredericksburg and its accompanying areas. Black women worked on plantations throughout the region, cultivating tobacco, wheat, and other crops, performing domestic labor, including cleaning, laundry, and caring for children, and preparing meals. Black women's work as cooks, servers, seamstresses, and domestic laborers was essential to the reputation for hospitality and comfort Virginia's plantation owners cultivated. We know a little bit about one woman in particular who was enslaved at Chatham Manor. Her name was Ellen Mitchell. 
In the 1850s, Chatham Manor was owned by a woman, a white woman named Hannah Coulter, who died in 1857. In her will, Coulter stipulated that the people she enslaved could either choose among her living relatives who would be their next enslaver or be free and leave the state of Virginia. Coulter's heirs challenged the will and won. The Supreme Court had recently decided in this Dred Scott case that black people were not American citizens and did not have access to the rights of citizenship. And so because Coulter tried to give the enslaved people at Chatham a choice, the will was rejected and J. Horace Lacey became the owner of the property and its people. Shout out to John Hennessy for much of this research. <laughs> Ellen Mitchell lived and worked in the laundry on the property, which still stands as you can see in this image. She was very light in complexion and literate, which was unusual for enslaved people at the time. She had five children believed to have been fathered by a white man. According to research done by the National Park Service, including John Hennessy, when Lacey took over the plantation, he planned to send many of the people enslaved there to Louisiana to work on another plantation. Ellen Mitchell refused to comply with this arrangement and convinced Lacey to sell her to the most prominent slave trader in Fredericksburg at the time, George Aller, who in turn allowed her to travel north for three months to raise $1,000 to purchase her freedom. <laughs> We don't know enough about Ellen Mitchell and her relationships with these men to understand how she negotiated this plan, but she was clearly an incredibly smart and adept person. As this article details, she traveled through Philadelphia, New York, and Washington, D.C. in early 1859, speaking with abolitionist groups and raising funds. You'll notice it calls her a white woman. Again, she was very light in complexion, but still considered African-American by the one-drop rule and by being born to an enslaved mother. Mitchell gathered the agreed upon amount and returned to Fredericksburg, where she and her five children were officially freed. She was also allowed to take her mother, and the whole family moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, where Ellen continued to work as a laundress. Ellen Mitchell's story is fascinating for many reasons, but one is that it shows the way enslaved women resisted their enslavement. Ellen Mitchell was able to negotiate and then crowdfund, which was likely possible because of her appearance and literacy. But enslaved African-American women found many different ways to resist throughout the period of enslavement. A common way many enslaved people resisted was by running away. My dear friend and colleague, Alexa McNeil, has been compiling a spreadsheet of the many ads for fugitive slaves found in local newspapers, of which there are hundreds. We call the enslaved people sought in these ads freedom seekers. I'd like to talk about one freedom seeker now, the mother of one of Fredericksburg's most beloved figures. Sarah Tucker was born in 1817. Her mother, Molly, was born in the late 1790s and enslaved by a man named Thomas Ware, to whom Sarah and her eight siblings were also enslaved. Sarah Tucker was also light in complexion, and in 1838, when she was 21 years old, she gave birth to a son, John M. Washington. We don't know the identity of John's father or how he got the last name Washington, but we do know that Sarah at that time was enslaved to Catherine and Francis. I know people pronounce this different ways, but I'm going to go with Talia Farrow. In 1840, Sarah was hired out to a farm in Orange County and brought John with her, who describes his childhood in the countryside in the narrative he wrote in 1873, Memories of the Past. We know Sarah attended a Baptist church in Orange County and that she was literate, though we don't know how she learned to read or write. On February 19, 1841, an advertisement appeared in the Fredericksburg Political Arena newspaper seeking a Negro woman, Sarah. Historian David Blight theorizes that this woman, sought by Thomas R. Ware Jr., was Sarah Tucker. She is described as, quote, about 20 years of age, a bright mulatto, and rather under the common size, unquote. That just means she's short. I don't, it's a funny way of putting it. No evidence survives to indicate how or when Sarah was captured or why she fled, but it is worth thinking about the circumstances that might have led to her decision to flee, leaving her three-year-old son. As Blight says, quote, she was surely a woman of unusual intelligence and resourcefulness if she managed to escape and remain on her own for a period of time, unquote. By 1848, Sarah had four more children, Louisa, Laura, Georgiana, and Lily, and the family was moved back to Fredericksburg. John was taken to serve on the second floor of the National Bank building, now the building that houses Foodie, and Sarah lived with the four younger children in a house on George Street near the Rappahannock River. 
John describes his mother as, quote, sent to live to herself without any help from her owners except doctor's bills, unquote. We do know John was able to visit his mother, mentioning that she gave him lessons in reading. Obviously, this is not Sarah Tucker. I haven't been able to find a picture of her yet, but if anybody knows of any, I would love to have one. In 1850, as many of you undoubtedly know, mother and son were separated. Sarah and her younger children were hired out to Staunton in Western Virginia, several hours from Fredericksburg. Washington captures the devastation of that separation in this passage, quote, Mrs. Talia Farrow came to the conclusion that mother, with my sisters Louisa, Laura, Georgiana, and brother Willie, would have to be sent to Staunton, Virginia. The night before mother left me, as I was to be kept in hand by the old mistress for a special use, she came up to my little room and laid down on my bed by me and begged me for her own sake, try and be a good boy, say my prayers every night, remember all she had tried to teach me, and always think of her. Her tears mingled with mine amid kisses and heartfelt sorrow. Bitter pangs filled my heart and thought I would rather die. On the morrow, mother and sisters and brother would all, all would leave me alone in this wide world to battle with temptation, trials, and hardship." Unquote. We often think about this passage from Washington's point of view, given that he is the author of the account. But today, I'd like to think about it from Sarah Tucker's perspective. Forced to leave her oldest son behind, unable to protect him or continue to teach him or care for him, unsure if she'd ever get to see him again. We do know that John was able to visit his family once more as a child when he became particularly ill and was sent to Staunton to recover. But I hope we can all today think of Sarah and the pain she experienced being separated from her child. Following John M. Washington's triumphal escape from slavery in April 1862 and following the end of the Civil War in 1865, Sarah and her husband Thomas Tucker reunited with her son and his family and settled in Washington, D.C. We don't know much about Sarah's life in DC, but we do know that she died in 1880 at the age of 62 and was buried at Mount Zion Cemetery in Georgetown. Sarah Tucker and Ellen Mitchell represent several of the major themes I'd like you to consider today, including the ways that enslaved women resisted, the generations of sexual assault to which enslaved women were subject, the violence and pain embedded in the institution of slavery, but also the ways enslaved women loved and cared for their families and the ingenuity and resourcefulness they demonstrated. Another, another major theme of this presentation is care for community. During the period of enslavement, black women enslaved and free worked to take care of each other, their families and their community. Women like Maria Louise Moore Richards, born free here in Fredericksburg in 1800, taught free black children in secret classes held in the basement of a house owned by William de Baptiste. She and her husband, Adolph Richards, were close with many of the most prominent early free black families in Fredericksburg, including the Lees, the Cooks, and the de Baptistes. There was no formal schooling for free black children at that time. Fielding Lewis had briefly run a brave school for the education of Negro children from 1765 to 1769 and free black people in Fredericksburg petitioned for a school for free black children in 1838, but were refused. Maria was educated likely by her parents or friends and passed on her education to children in her community. According to Jason C. Grant, however, the school was quote, finally broken up and the woman who taught it given to understand she was not to teach Negroes free or slave, unquote. unquote. The lack of educational opportunities for free black people resulted in many free black families leaving the state of Virginia in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, including Mrs. Richards, who left Fredericksburg for Detroit in 1851. Her daughter, Fanny, pictured here, became an important educator and created the first kindergarten class in Michigan. During the Civil War, many enslaved black women chose to self-emancipate, though that was often difficult. We know of at least 10,000 enslaved people who freed themselves by escaping behind Union lines in 1862. I know many of you are familiar with this story. Women who escaped at this time were known as contraband to denote their status not as free people, but as property seized from war. As an aside, this is one of the reasons the Emancipation Proclamation was so important. It gave enslaved people in Confederate states official free status. That number, 10,000, comes from a report by W.W. W. Wright, the engineer and superintendent of the U.S. Military Railroad, who wrote on September 17, 1862, quote, 
During the last two days, the contrabands fairly swarmed about the Fredericksburg and Falmouth stations, and there was a continuous black line of men, women, and children moving north along the road, carrying all their worldly goods on their heads. Every train running to Aquia was crowded with them. They all seemed to have perfect confidence that if they could only get within our lines, they would be taken care of somehow. I think it's safe to estimate the number of contrabands that have passed by this route since we took possession of the road at 10,000. This image, which I know many of you are familiar with, was taken by Timothy O'Sullivan on August 19th, 1862, and captures a black family at the moment they chose to cross the Rappahannock River to freedom. We can see several women in bonnets and dresses nestled among their belongings on the wagon. We don't know much about this family, but we can conjecture that they were in a better condition than many of their contemporaries with access to transportation, horses, clothing, and possessions. So much of this work is about reading between the lines, trying to glean information even when so little is readily available to us. I like to believe that this family was able to settle somewhere safe, set up new lives for themselves, and experience some version of contentment and freedom following the Civil War. In the years following emancipation, newly freed people attempted to find the family members from whom they'd been separated. One strategy they used was called lost friends ads, which ran in newspapers across the country. These newspapers ran columns in which freed people could publish messages in the hopes of locating their family members, many, many of whom they had not seen in years. The ad you see here is available through an incredible database created by the Historic New Orleans Collection. As you can see, this ad was placed by Mrs. Alice Rebecca Lewis, who is looking for her mother and her sisters. Her mother's name was Martha Jackson, and she was brought to Fredericksburg and sold here in 1855. This ad demonstrates the considerable difficulty formerly enslaved people faced in locating their loved ones. They, enslaved people were sold away or moved around at the whims of their enslavers. They had no control over where they went or even what they were called. And so the pieces of information freed people had access to in order to help locate their loved ones made it very hard to find them. Additionally, given the fact that most enslaved people were not permitted to learn how to read or write, even placing these ads was a barrier. Pastors were encouraged to read these ads out loud to the members of their congregations in the hopes that those sought after would hear from their seekers. Lost Friends ads provide a glimpse of the years following emancipation, the choices people, especially women, made with their newfound freedom, and the lingering hardships wrought by slavery. How are we doing? Everybody's okay? Are you so bored? If you're so bored, you can, you can head out. I know, you know, it's... Okay, good. I won't be offended. In the first half of the 20th century, African-American women worked with their families to build homes, establish communities, create businesses, and advocate for political and social advancement, all under the fear and intimidation of segregation. Roger Braxton and Terry Miller, in their incredible photographic history, African Americans of Spotsylvania County, share the stories of several black women born during enslavement who carved out lives for themselves following emancipation. Church was an integral part of this transition. Braxton and Miller write about Mrs. Alsie Ellis, who built a home with her husband Fleming on the grounds of the former Ellis Plantation, where 15 community members met regularly to organize the first New Hope Baptist Church. Similarly, Lydia B. Coleman, pictured here, worked as the sexton for Beulah Colored Baptist Church while raising her family. After she died, her youngest daughter, Dora Coleman Johnson, donated part of her, land, her family's land to construct a phys physical building, which opened in, in 1932. African American women at this time often worked as domestic laborers, washerwomen, cooks, and housekeepers. Many worked on family farms alongside their husbands and children, and some, like Miss Nancy Diggs here, combined domestic work and farming. She and her husband, William Henry White, built a home off Route 208 and welcomed travelers in need of food and lodging. According to Braxton and Miller, Miss Nancy would plant and harvest her 40 acres during the summer and fall, and then traveled to New York during the winter to clean hotels. I love this quote included in the book, quote, known for paying cash for her purchases, Nancy would smile and say, I'm not owing no man nothing but love, unquote. <laughs> Julia Sproul Ross Frazier was born and slaved in Spotsylvania County in 1854, one of 16 children born to Lavinia and Charles Sproul. 
Following emancipation, she and her family moved to Fredericksburg. Frazier became an essential leader at Shiloh Baptist Church Old Site, serving as a deaconess, starting the Pastors Aid Club, later changed to Church Aid, and raising significant funds for the purchase and installation of a new pipe organ for the church's sanctuary, unveiled in May 1925. Ms. Frazier died in January 1939. African American women were also instrumental in publishing the Shiloh Herald, started by Reverend B. H. Hester in 1925. The Herald published local news articles, an essential service at a time when there were no black newspapers in the area. You can see some of the incredible women and their incredible outfits who were part of the Shiloh Herald staff at this time in this image. And I hope to work with Shiloh Old Site um, staff and historians to find out more about the individual women who contributed to the Herald. Julia Frazier and the Shiloh Herald staff represent the incredibly long and important history of black women's church work here in Fredericksburg and the surrounding regions. African-American women have also long been part of Fredericksburg's history of black business ownership. We have evidence of two women who supported themselves through hospitality in the 20th century. In 2002, Dovetail Cultural Resources Group conducted archival research and performed an archeological excavation at 1416 Princess Anne Street. Dovetail found that the house that sat there, first constructed around 1872, was utilized as an African-American boarding house by the 1910s. In 1914, a black woman named Emma Carter bought the property, and the house continued to be in use as an African-American boarding house for the next 50 years. Um, the house was sold and demolished in 1990. And Dovetail found ceramic pieces, which you can see some of those here, including shards from a teapot, plates, cups, bottles, and a goblet fragment, as well as medicine bottles and jewelry, a nice glimpse into the domestic life of this shared residence. Similarly, in the 1940s, when black travelers had to use resources like the Green Book, a travel guide that identified businesses that would accept African-American customers, there was a listing for Fredericksburg for a tourist home owned by a woman named Bertha White Scott. Mrs. Scott was identified as a washer in the 1880 census, but by 1940, she seems to have made her living by running a boarding house with her daughter, Mariah Richards, who served as a cook and several lodgers staying with her in that year's census. Her house was identified at 207 Fifth Street, though it no longer stands. And I wanna thank uh, Helen Ross and Shannon Lee for help with that research on these African-American boarding houses. Mildred Brown Queen demonstrates both African-American business ownership and political activism. Born in 1913, she attended elementary school in Fredericksburg and graduated from Virginia State College. Her father, Arthur Brown, started Brown's Funeral Home in 1918 on the 500 block of Princess Anne Street. Mildred Brown Queen ran the funeral home after her father's death. She served on the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and became the first black woman to serve on the Democratic Committee and as a delegate for the Democratic National Convention in Chicago for the Fredericksburg area. She is perhaps best known for her efforts for African-American voter registration. A committed member of Shiloh Baptist Church New Site, she is recognized on Fredericksburg's Wall of Honor for her work during the Civil Rights Movement. You ready, Miss Gay? Oh. <laughs> yeah, let's. <laughs> African American women's efforts during the civil rights movement in Fredericksburg have been well documented. Mrs. Gladys Poles Todd and Mrs. Mamie Scott were both influential community activists, instrumental in organizing the sit in movement here. Gladys Elizabeth Poles Todd was born in Washington, D.C. on March 4, 1913. Her parents, James and Annie Jackson Poles, separated when she was two years old, and she moved to Fredericksburg to live with her aunt, Lena Jackson Alexander. She was baptized at Shiloh Baptist Church Old Site, attended the Fredericksburg Colored School, and completed the teacher training program at Virginia State College in Petersburg. She began teaching in Fredericksburg before marrying Clarence R. Todd in 1942. <clears throat> the two had one daughter, Miss Gay, who I'll talk more about in a minute. Mrs. Todd was a committed member of the NAACP, and in 1960, alongside Dr. Philip Wyatt, Mrs. Mamie Scott, and other community leaders, spearheaded the sit-in movement here in Fredericksburg. She writes about her memories of the movement in Ruth Fitzgerald's A Different Story. Quote, 
We were anxious that our demonstration would run smoothly and without a hitch, so we tried to cover every minute detail. We discussed and drew up rules of conduct, dress, parental approval, etc. If anyone has those rules, please give them to me. I really want to see them in person. Um, later, these rules were mimeographed and distributed to sitters. Lists were compiled of days and hours each youth would be available to sit in. Ours would be a passive movement of sit-ins to effect a change in the policy of those who discriminated. Around the first week of July, we began to sit in at People's Drug Store, F.W. Woolworths, and W.T. Grants. For a few days, we were the town's sideshow, unquote. Obviously, the sit-in movement was successful. After a summer of carefully orchestrated protests, counters desegregated. Once again, I'd like to have Mrs. Todd speak for herself. She ended her chapter in a different story with this, quote, gradually, one after another, food counters all over town began to open to us. We did not merely sit in to open counters to us. We helped to change attitudes, which in turn opened new opportunities and doors to us. We gained the courage to test the legality of many injustices, which continued to be heaped upon us. Most of all, we as blacks gained a better sense of self-image and self-esteem, unquote. I encourage everyone to read her whole chapter in a different story. It's really compelling. Do you know, I hope this picture is okay with you. I got it from your mom. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Todd spent the rest of her life advocating for her community, caring for her family and friends, and positively influencing everyone around her. She earned the nickname Mom because so many people loved and looked up to her, and because of the care and generosity of spirit she exhibited. Mrs. Tol Mrs. Poles Todd passed away on Tuesday, January 20th, 2015, at the age of 101. All right. It's hard to do these when the person you're talking about is in the room, but we're going to do our best. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Todd's daughter, Ms. Gaya Dagvalola, has continued her family's legacy of community activism combined with a career as a teacher and blues musician. Born here in Fredericksburg, Ms. Gay attended Walker Grant High School and graduated as class valedictorian in 1961. As mentioned, she was a leader in the Fredericksburg sit-in movement when this iconic photograph was taken and later graduated from Boston University. She became involved with the Black Power Movement in New York and returned to Fredericksburg in 1970 where she became a teacher in local schools. She worked with her father on Harambe 360 Interpretive Theater and the Fredericksburg Black Arts Festival, received her master's in education from Virginia State University in 1978, and in 1982, she was honored as Virginia's Teacher of the Year. While teaching, caring for her family, including her son Juno, Miss Gay also performed as a musician. Sapphire, the Uppity Blues Women, was formed as a duo in 1984 with Ms. Gaya Dagvalola and Ann Rabson, with Erlene Lewis joining later. Lewis was replaced by Andre Fay in 1992, and Sapphire recorded their first album, Middle Age Blues, in 1987. Ms. Gay recorded her first solo album, Bittersweet Blues, in 1999, and has continued to perform all over the world for the last several decades. Ms. Gay was honored as one of the Library of Virginia's Women in History in, in 2018. She is my hero, and I adore her, and Fredericksburg is so lucky to have her here. Also, like, how cool does she look in these pictures? I hadn't seen these with this one on the right before, and I'm really excited that I got to show it today. <laughs> Hope that's okay with you, Miss Gay. <laughs> that's a fact. That's facts. Like Miss Gay Adegbalola, Ambassador Pamela Bridgewater is another example of a Fredericksburg local with a global reach. Ambassador Bridgewater was born here in Fredericksburg, and she attended Walker Grant High School before attending undergraduate at Virginia State University and then graduating from the University of Cincinnati with her master's. She entered the U.S. Foreign Service in 1980, serving as a diplomat in South Africa and working with Nelson Mandela before her appointment as United States Ambassador to Benin, Benin from 2000 to 2002, U.S. Ambassador to Ghana under President George W. Bush from 2005 to 2008, and U.S. Ambassador to Jamaica under President Obama from 2010 to 2013. In 2019, Ambassador Bridgewater published a book about her grandfather, Reverend B. H. Hester, who I mentioned earlier. The publication, Neutral on Nothing, The Social Activism of the Reverend Dr. B. H. Hester, explores Reverend Hester's life, leadership at Shiloh Baptist Church Old Site, and political activism in and around Fredericksburg. It also contains some really beautiful images and objects representing Reverend Hester's life. 
So I wanted to highlight this publication because it speaks to some of the most important work, important and under-recognized work that black women have and continue to do here in Fredericksburg as community historians. Documenting and saving African-American history has not always been priorities for mainstream historians. And that is true here as it is elsewhere. Black women like Ambassador Bridgewater, Ms. Gaya Dagbalola, Ms. Alda White, Ms. Eunice Hagler, among many others, have ensured the preservation, accessibility, and dissemination of their community stories so that people like me and my colleagues at the museum can continue working to expand and uplift African-American public history efforts in this area. This commitment leads me directly to the next outstanding individual I'd like to highlight today. We can give her a clap too. She deserves it. Um, as probably everyone in this room knows, one of the most important people in Fredericksburg's, Afri um, in Fredericksburg's history is Reverend Lawrence Davies, longest serving pastor at Old Site and the city's first black mayor elected in 1976. Reverend Davies is a towering figure in Fredericksburg, literally and figuratively and represents the culmination of decades of black political activism in this area. But the person who deserves the spotlight today is an incredible figure in her own right, Mrs. Janice Pride Davies. Born in Washington, D.C., Ms. Janice taught elementary school for 12 years in D.C., helping integrate the school system in the early 1960s. After meeting and marrying Mr. Davies, the pair moved to Fredericksburg in 1962, so Reverend Davies could become pastor of Old Sight. Ms. Janice spent the next several decades supporting her partner, his congregation, and his political career in taking care of their three daughters, Lauren, Karen, and Sharon. Simultaneously, Mrs. Davies established her own reputation as a community leader. She held offices locally and statewide with the American Cancer Society and co-founded the Fredericksburg Area Sickle Cell Association. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease that affects African Americans at much higher rates than people of other ethnicities. After two of their three daughters were diagnosed with the disorder, Ms. Davies started the FASCA to support sufferers as they navigate the disease, helping them find resources, referral services, and establishing support systems. Mrs. Janice Davies was celebrated with a community event in November 2017, organized by Ambassador Bridgewater and Xavier Richardson. More than 200 people participated in an afternoon tea at Fredericksburg Baptist Church, coupled with the establishment of a scholarship in her name created by Shiloh Baptist Church Old Site. I really love this quote from the program, quote, Mrs. Davies embraced Fredericksburg and the community in turn embraced her, unquote. I'm gonna leave this here for a second while I take a drink of water so we can all look at her. And Miss Gay. I wanna talk about one more community leader before wrapping up. I just got a thumbs up from Ms. Gay, so I think we're doing okay. <laughs> uh, this woman represents the long history of black women educators in this region. So many of the women I've mentioned today have roots as teachers, recognizing the absolute important, importance of education in general, but in black communities specifically. The history of black education and black teachers in this region is a whole presentation in and of itself. Don't worry, I'm already working on it. For now, let's talk about Marguerite Bailey Young. The second of eight children, Mrs. Young graduated from Virginia State College before moving to Fredericksburg to teach at Walker Grant High School in 1957. Over the next 30 years, she would serve at several of Fredericksburg City schools. She taught English and business classes at Walker Grant and then taught math and citizenship at Fredericksburg Middle School after integration. She taught business at James Monroe and then became principal there in 1976 before becoming director of instruction for all city schools. She secured grant funding for the schools, spearheaded tutoring programs, and even returned to Walker Grant Middle School following her retirement to serve as interim principal. Marguerite Bailey Young has touched the lives of hundreds if not thousands of students and families in this area, and I don't think it is possible to overstate her influence in this community. In 2019, Ms. Gaya Dagbalola said of Mrs. Young, quote, Mrs. Young taught me to teach. Her contributions to the welfare of the children of Fredericksburg have been without parallel. She gave loving encouragement to all of us. She, along with many of Walker Grant's teachers, taught us to cheer loudest when we were losing. Unconditional love, unquote. Of all the themes I hope to convey today, 
love is the most consistent. The women in this presentation love their families, their communities, and their history, and we are all the beneficiaries of this love. I'd like to wrap up today by talking about black women in Fredericksburg's present and future. There are so many women in this area doing such incredible work to take care of our community. From Mrs. Juanita Shanks, President and Chief Executive Officer of Failsafe Era, which helps those who have been incarcerated transition back into their communities, to Dr. Tiffany Ray Patterson, Vice President of Student Services and Equity Advancement and Chief Diversity Officer at Germanic Community College, from Alexa and Ashley McNeil, sisters, yeah, they deserve some claps. <laughs> sisters from Mayfield who led an oral history project preserving the stories of Mayfield residents and who now do incredible work at community nonprofits, Alexa at the Fredericksburg Area Museum with me and Ashley at the Community Foundation, to Dr. Siobhan Shorter, Associate Provost for Equity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer at the University of Mary Washington. And of course, the illustrious Ms. Dr. Marcy Catlett, <laughs> Superintendent of Fredericksburg City Public Schools. These are just a few of the amazing collection of African American women working here today, and they are part of the long legacy of black women's history in the Fredericksburg area. I'm honored to call them my sisters. Thank you. Thank you.